Module 12 Relational Summary Lecture GWP2, The Law of the Jungle. Since the forests, mature, intercropped, mosaic, biodiverse, silvopastoral, carbon sequestering, rhizomally communicating, and interconnected. The secret to their success lies under the forest floor, where vast root systems support the towering trunks above. Partnering with these roots are symbiotic fungi called mycorrhizae. These fungi have countless branching, thread-like hyphae that together make up the mycelium. The mycelium spreads across a much larger area than the tree root system and connects the roots of different trees together. These connections form mycorrhizal networks. Through mycorrhizal networks, fungi can pass resources and signaling molecules between trees. Air purifying, rain forming, water cleaning, microclimate buffering, beautiful forests really are the solution, not just to climate disruption, but to so many other existential issues. Let's talk about the politics of the forest as opposed to the so-called law of the jungle. You see, recent archaeology is showing us that the Amazon isn't really wild at all. Just as we learned that the beautiful mosaic landscapes of Yosemite National Park in North America were actually curated by the Native Americans who engaged in controlled burns and intense wildlife management and practices of regenerative agriculture that actually made the land more abundant. Explorations by satellite using penetrating side aperture radar and the analysis of the carbon in the terra preta, rich black soils, show that the rainforest held huge populations of people living in what were basically forest cities for generations. At times, we find evidence that they did screw up, as Maya development specialist Pedro Cook told me about Mesoamerica and his people transitioning from bread nut to corn. But as long as enough forest was protected and the seed dispersing and pollen distributing birds and mammals and insects and soil forming and aerating organisms are intact and can bounce back, we humans could and still go back to the backwoods whenever things need correcting. It's why there are still entire peoples living in the deepest jungles despite knowing about our agricultural civilization for thousands of years. People saw us and literally fled to the deepest, most isolated forests to get away from us. And they didn't have to take their animals with them and try to corral them because, as my professors taught me, clever forest peoples would simply influence the plants that grew along the trails that led to their villages and ensure that certain watering holes were always stopped and let the animals come to them looking for nourishment and water. Then they would swiftly and silently take a ruminant or other herbivore with an almost invisible blow dart or poison arrow or spear and the other animals would hardly notice. So the animals didn't flee knowing no fear of the forest people and the people didn't need to burn down or cut down their forest to graze them. They would only engage in managed burns, in managed slash and burn rituals that could release nutrients back into the soil and create mosaics for more animal diversity to exploit, allowing time for the forest to regenerate as they moved from plot to plot. There really is no incompatibility between a forest ecology and a rich and abundant human diet. Once again, it really isn't about the cows. The whole rainforest beef thing, as I've said, cutting and burning primeval forests to create pasture to graze cattle for cheap beef turns out to have little to do with true economics and everything to do with political economy. As emphasized in the book by my UCLA mentor professor, Dr. Susanna B. Hecht and prize-winning journalist Alexander Cockburn, the fate of the forest, developers, destroyers, and defenders of the Amazon, the Amazon isn't being destroyed to grow beef. It's being cut as a form of land speculation to establish political ownership, land tenure, and to garner political support for elites in the cities. One chilling fact she points out is that while forests are far, far more productive than grassland or monocropping agriculture, it's hard to tell where one person's land begins and another ends in an aerial surveyor's map, particularly when they were black and white. So to render the landscape and property rights legible to folks in administrative offices, Administrators doing cadastral surveys convinced ranchers and farmers that they really needed to chop all the trees down and put a big fence around their property. Squares and rectangles are preferred, even though nature really doesn't like a straight line. Cadastral mapping to make the landscape legible and simplified, as James Scott talks about in Seeing Like a State, 
lies at the core of deforestation. Imagine that. It's sickening, but it does offer some hope. That is, if this is really about marking territory today, with satellites and Google Maps and GIS and layers, nobody should have to cut down any trees just to know the boundaries of a property. <clears throat> Further, and as I've said previously, this may tick off some of my fellow vegetarian and vegan allies, but it must be emphasized until it really sinks in, cows aren't the problem with the rainforest today. In the past, the horror was that trees were cut and the timber sold and then pasture was sowed and then the cattle grazed it to death overgrazed it to death, a true tragedy of the commons, until the rains washed away the thin tropical topsoil. And there isn't really much topsoil to speak of in rainforests since they cycle nutrients so rapidly. And then the land turns into aluminum and iron laced laterite hard pan where a few plants can gain a foothold again. And this leads to desertification, of course. But as Dr. Hecht reminded us, in places where corridors of trees and forests, particularly riparian ecosystems, that is riverine forests, strips and contours, were preserved, the birds and insects and mammals and reptiles eventually break up and aerate the dirt and dump seeds in there with life-giving manures, and the forest can come back. The real scourge isn't beef, she said, it's soy. Why soy? Because in a perverse sense, soy is sustainable. And here's the problem with sustainability. If you don't use all of your nexus thinking powers, you could end up sustaining the wrong thing. Dr. Hecht was very clear. The very thing that makes soy so good is what makes it so bad. Soy, like almost all legumes, is a nitrogen fixer. In a sense, it's self-fertilizing. Its root nodules are able to pull nitrogen out of thin air and make it available to itself and to other plants. And normally, this is a very good thing. We use a type of perennial peanut, Arrakis glabrata, from South America, here, not just as a wonderful yellow flowered and hardy ground cover to replace the scourge of grass, but to help naturally fertilize our avocado trees at Rosebud. And George Washington Carver is said to have saved the South by introducing Arrakis hypogea, the goober peanut or ground nut that we all know from peanut butter. And he used it to replace the nitrogen that plantation owners obsessed with the plow, possibly because it reinforces male stereotypes of penetration before seeding and goes along with a macho culture of territorial expansion, had allowed to disappear through erosion. So yes, legumes can be very good. But, and here's the rub, the problem with soy, which my professor studied in Bolivia, is that this non-native crop sustains itself and so the land never goes back to being forest where the trees taken out by Sweden slash and burn agriculture or grazing technically could return, the soy monocrop that replaces forests today are, like our perennial peanuts, forever. There's no incentive to ever bring the wildlife back, so all you see in Bolivia and Brazil now are endless rows of monocropped pesticide and herbicide-laced soybean, soybean, soybean. Couple that with the fact that most of that soy is grown for export to feed cattle and pigs and other animals in concentrated animal feedlots, and you have a recipe for ecological disaster. The politics of it, of course, couldn't be clearer. Since soy is world, a world-traded commodity used in everything from animal feed to human food to inks and industrial chemicals and pharmaceuticals, think phytoestrogens, there's every incentive to create policies that favor the conversion of rainforest into soy field, regardless of the fact that soy evolved as a crop for the Asian North temperate zones in the East. It really has no business being in the West, though Benjamin Franklin was a huge champion of it as a cash crop for America and went to great lengths to plant his own demonstration fields. Still, most American farms use soy in rotation, especially up in Nebraska and in the Midwest, because the winter killed off most of the plants anyway, particularly the annual ones like the original soybean. This is one case where annual crops can actually make more ecological sense than perennials, despite the fact that we really need to move away from annuals and back to perennial biomass, which is drawdown solution number 51 in your book, responsible for reducing 3.33 gigatons of CO2 at a cost of just $77.9 billion of the net savings of $549.9 billion. We must return our prairies to deep-rooted perennial grasses and away from annuals, for example. But the recent successful attempts to grow nothing but perennial soy forever, sustainably, in the tropics is one of the worst things that could have happened to the fate of the forest.
The vegans and vegetarians are of course quite right when they criticize concentrated animal feedlots, saying the plants we grow should feed humans rather than being grown to feed animals to feed humans, and none of us should be eating animals that are fed annual wheat, rice, corn, or other grains, or soy. But by that same token, given the ecological and health effects of grains and soy, no human should be eating these products either. The solution, of course, is agroforestry and silvopastoral systems. But politically, these are very difficult to get traction behind because such systems require a substantial upfront investment and the sunk costs take years to be recouped given how long it takes to grow tree cereals and tree protein and fruits and berries and nuts and establish permaculture. However, once mature systems are in place, it is quite, quite possible that the win-win of it all will convince powerful enough political actors. After all, and for the record, as I stated in the last lecture and want to be sure because it's so important that you internalize, cows don't really like grass at all and much prefer and do better nutritionally wandering through rows of shrubs and trees, browsing on the leaves and twigs and shoots the way deer and elk do. Remember, the eastern cows, the European cows that now dominate the west, were not grassland animals like the bison that they replaced after the politicians representing the white settlers hired Buffalo Bill Cody and the U.S. Army to drive them to extinction as a political act to destroy Native American self-sufficiency. There are African and Middle Eastern bovines that had adapted to grasslands, but the European cow descended from the auroch, all of whom were killed off during the enclosure acts when European royalty drove peasants off their lands, goodbye indigenous knowledge, and fenced off the forests, spawning the rise of rebels like legendary Robin Hood and his merry men. The auroch that has been worshipped and used as a food source for millennia by the Celtic Druidic forest people, and had thrived when people lived among them, couldn't survive the wholesale conversion of Europe's wooded lands to the grain agriculture introduced from the Middle East and the European expansion. Discover Magazine tells us, quote, by the early 17th century, the final holdouts of aurochs survived in the Jaktoro forest in Poland, protected by noblemen who also liked to hunt them. The death of the last aurochs in 1627 was also the world's first recorded extinction, end quote. As I've said today, I regularly witness OJ, the bull we have at Rosebud, rearing up on his hind legs with his front hooves on the big trees we have here, getting a nibble on the oak leaves within his reach. If he's grazing peacefully on a patch of fresh grass and I grab some oak branches and wave them at him from across the field, he will drop what he's doing and make a run for me to get at this tasty treat. And yet, Rosebud is plagued by an exotic, invasive, non-native grass called Kogan grass, Imperata cylindrica, that was brought to Florida by the Agricultural Extension Agency of UF in the 1930s when Florida was starting to be used to, be, to finish off industrial cattle so they could be advertised as grass-fed beef on the market. Now, nobody thought to create plantations of Florida native oaks and other trees and shrubs that cattle loved. Instead, they cut the trees and drained the swamps and planted kogan. It was done for political reasons. You can read more about it in Grasslands and Climate Change, Chapter 16, Climate Change and the Politics and Science of Traditional Grassland Management from Part 3, Dealing with Climate Change Effects by Michael R. Duff. Kogan grass is now considered a threat. The cows hated it. It cuts their tongues with its sharp and destructible blades, and it crowds out all the edible plants with its impenetrable root mat. Such an irony. At the same time, Florida communities get fined up to $500 a day if the beautiful native wildflower Biden's alba, aka shepherd's needles or butterfly needles or Spanish needles, grows over six inches, as happened to 84-year-old National Geographic explorer Dr. Sylvia Earle when she left to dive under the Antarctic ice shelf to examine climate change impacts last year. She came home to a $28,000 fine. But when we grab a handful of these shepherd's needles, these shrubs, we don't have sheep, but if we offer them to OJ and his mate or to the goats from across the field at Rosebud, they also immediately abandon grazing and trot over to get this wonderfully prolific treat that revives the soil and is our beehive's favorite flower as well. You see, the inclusive rule of the forest is quite different from the so-called competitive law of the jungle. A forest is a self-reinforcing, self-sustaining system that maximizes productivity. 
It should be used as an analogy for how our politics should work. It co-evolves in the e pluribus unum way that creates a unified whole out of biodiversity, a united states of being for each state of being. It is a metaphor for the way we should run our lives. It's no, is it no wonder then that the capital city of Guatemala, the height of Mayan civilization, was Iximche, which means the breadnut tree, the tree of life? Doesn't it say something about a people's politics when they name their political capitals after something life-sustaining? When I had just graduated from college and was on a Michael C. Rockefeller Fellowship doing research in the primary rainforests of Borneo in the Far East, I wrote a letter about what I was experiencing to Harvard psychology professor B.F. Skinner, whose book walled in two about an attempt to take Thoreau's idea of nature at forested Walden Pond, Wald means forest in German, in Massachusetts, and turn them into a thriving ecological community was one of the books in the big suitcase full of utopian literature books I hauled to the jungle from London so I'd have something to read at night by lamplight as I studied rainforest ecology from inside. The combination of ecology by day and a deep dive into the politics of sustainability at night led me to some big epiphanies that have stayed to this day, and I explored them all in a long letter to Dr. Skinner that I typed on the primitive manual typewriter we had in the jungle where we had no electricity or running water for the year, with the exception of two solar panels I maintained at base camp for the data computer. I had been scuba diving in Malaysia a month or two before arriving in Borneo, working with an ecological restoration project to remove invasive crown of thorn starfish that were responding to climate changes by multiplying and destroying the reefs. My letter explained to Dr. Skinner how I was coming to think that if we could design our cities based on coral reef and rainforest ecologies with their stacked functions and overlapping and redundant and self-reinforcing systems, and if we could design our politics based on the principles of symbiosis and mutualism and co-evolution that I saw in the mature and intact parts of the forest and reef, where parasitism was at a minimum, disturbance species were kept in check, not eradicated, playing the ecological role they evolved to play without damaging the overall stasis of the climax community, and even commensalism, where one party benefits and another doesn't but isn't made worse off, is at a low frequency, then we truly would have a utopia. I asked him what he thought, and it took five weeks for my letter to get to the U.S., and then five weeks for his answer to come back. But in his reply, he called me, a 23-year-old recent college graduate, Dr. Culhane, his kind of Skinnerian positive reinforcement, and encouraged me to continue down this fruitful path of inquiry and strive to put these ideas into action. And so, here I am today. Here I am, having lived in rainforests and explored coral reefs, confident that the English political philosopher Hobbes, whom we studied freshman year at Harvard, was quite wrong when he described life in nature as nasty, brutish, and short. And Lord Tennyson was quite wrong when he described nature as red in tooth and claw. Predation exists and parasitism exists, but they're not the inviolate law of the forest, only the law of the disturbed jungle, where disorder and disturbance cause a struggle for existence. In time, when allowed, much more complex and subtle relationships evolve, creating the foundation for emotions like love and charity and respect, altruism. We humans spent hundreds of thousands of years going back and forth between forest and savanna, forest and savanna, as the climate changed, and we learned a lot from those shifts, mostly preferring to get back to Eden when we could. It was only about 10,000 years ago when one group in the Middle East seems to have gotten addicted to annual grains and created a way of thinking about the world that is more akin to the way locusts operate than the way most humans do. We know that because when the people of the Middle East and then Europe started to extend their empires west and south, they kept running into peoples who kept their forests and continued to thrive within them. And curiously, when they headed further east to Southeast Asia, to Borneo, they found that not only were there people who had never left the forest, but there were also people who actually left the fields to get back to it. I learned this during my studies in anthropology and my time in Indonesia, and I'll end with this. As I mentioned early on in this course, neither ecological nor political conditions are really affected by longitude. If anything, just as with ecology, there's been much more convergent evolution of political systems between West and East when the ecologies they are founded in are also similar.
Forest people, tree huggers, are remarkably self-similar, east or west. And the defining characteristic seems to be how far they are from the centers of agriculture-based political power. For this reason, regardless of which hemisphere you live in, or which quarter sphere, you're more likely to share political ideas with people whose subsistence base is similar to yours. Another great series of books I read in college and graduate school were Isaac Asimov's Tomes on History, which culminated in his Asimov's Chronology of the World, The History of the World from the Big Bang to Modern Times. Asimov opened my eyes to the reality that in actuality, capitalism, socialism, and communism were actually the same system, an extractive system of oligarchic control and accumulation of power whose shifting parts played with and against one another as part of a coherent, if brutal, whole. The notion was echoed in my later graduate school readings of the 19th century economic philosopher Leon Walras, who formulated the marginal theory of value and pioneered the development of general equilibrium theory, and the work of André Gunderfranck, who promoted dependency theory after 1970 and world systems theory after 1984. The basic idea is that supposed antipodes of political economy, modern capitalism and communism, are merely two sides of the same coin used in the currency of power consolidation. If there really are two political ideas that truly oppose one another and have relevance in the age of climate disruption, it would be the two identified by Daniel Quinn, an award-winning author who was a friend of my dad's when they were journalists together, in his parable Ishmael from 1992. Quinn in that book has a speaking gorilla tell humanity the real distinction which is between leavers and takers. Capitalists, socialists, communists, fascists, and certainly agriculturalists are what Quinn calls taker societies. Their politics is the politics of profit, of accumulation at any cost. Meanwhile, forest societies and hunter-gatherers in general are leavers whose politics revolves around ensuring the system sustains so that resources are left there from seven generations into perpetuity. And this is why West or East doesn't really matter at all, and for that matter, neither does North or South, for it all comes down to subsistence strategy. Those who blundered into agriculture, whether North or South or East or West, found themselves trapped into systems that demanded control over nature and control over an ever-growing amount of people and their labor to try and keep nature under control. Those who avoided agriculture were able to focus on systems thinking that kept the weeds and pests under control for them. Kept them under control for them. Nature did it. It wasn't at all the way our history books taught us. The absurd notion that agriculture was responsible for the creation of the cradle of civilization and our freedom from the elements. <clears throat> As Professor Heck stressed in her classes at UCLA, this is just a just-so story that our culture teaches us to keep us on the treadmill. And there have been many peoples who've realized this and simply abandoned agriculture in favor of a lever lifestyle. For instance, around the time when many other tribes in Borneo, the world's largest island, were experimenting with rice growing, introduced by Chinese traders, a couple of groups within the tribes called the Kenya weighed the options and decided it was a crappy life. Why, they asked themselves, would anybody work in the hot sun by the sweat of their bow brow, trying to plow the unforgiving earth just for a weak harvest of a little grain each year, with thistles and thorns following their efforts, as the Bible points out. It's the embodiment of the curse given to Adam and Eve in Genesis. So after practicing agriculture for a few generations, they said, screw it. And they let the land go wild and went into the rainforest and merged with the Penan people, becoming not primeval hunters and gatherers, but modern hunters and gatherers. In other words, they turned their back on agriculture and decided that hunting and gathering was actually more advanced. And so they remain to this day, fighting hard politically and with their lives to preserve their forest homeland, suffering repeated attempts at extermination by the agricultural communities and the multinationals who want to turn the entire island into oil palm plantations. I heard the same story from a regal Batak tribesman covered in tattoos with bone piercings in his face whom I shared a bus ride with through the winding jungle roads of Sumatra one day. He turned to me and said in an accusing voice, Anda Nasrani atau Muslim? Indonesian for, are you Christian or Muslim? Christian, I replied meekly, wondering where this conversation was gonna go. He thumped on his chest 
I am Christian, he said proudly. Do you know why? I'd love to hear, I replied. All this was going on in Indonesian, by the way, and he was super pleased I could understand what he wanted to say. He smiled and asked, gesturing to the heavens, what kind of God would forbid a man from eating babi hutan, the forest pig? The Muslims came here and they said, no eating pig. It is forbidden. Instead, you must grow rice as we do. As we do. And my people said, this is miserable. It is hard labor in the hot sun and it doesn't taste good. And nobody can be strong eating rice. And the Christianaries, Christian missionaries came and they said, God says you can eat babi hutan. And we said, thanks be to God because we can eat babi hutan in the cool shade of the forest and it sustains us and it is delicious. This is why I am Christian. And I guess for many people, that's what really counts. Forest people in particular don't really understand why any God would curse us with suffering just to grow our food. And even the Christian forest people don't quite get Genesis since they still live in an Eden. When I was working with missionaries in Borneo and stayed with the Christian Dayak tribes people of the forest, I was amazed to see that hunting and gathering really just involved gathering. An old witch doctor woman and her grandson took me into the forest to get the materials to prepare our celebration meal. And most of the day was spent with her slowly ambling down the cool forest trails with her walking stick and pointing at various plants and vines and flowers and fruit, at which point the little boy would scramble up a tree with delight, grab the ingredients, and drop back to the damp leaf-covered earth. As for the protein part of the meal, I was astonished to find that the hut we were celebrating in was built on stilts and the bottom floor had an open corral that housed pigs and chickens who could wander in and out at their leisure. Above it, I noticed when I asked to use the bathroom, was a squat toilet. Our fecal material and whatever food scraps they had would be dropped through the hole and into the open corral below where the animals rooted and pecked, turning our food and bodily wastes back into nutritious food that we were going to eat. Immediately corroborating what my professors had said, hunters in the forest didn't really hunt much except for fun. Without gunfire scaring off the animals, <laughs> all they had to do was create the right conditions and the animals came to them. So much for the myth of a difficult life, nasty, brutish, and short, and the law of the jungle. National Geographic explorer in residence Wade Davis, who I'm proud to call a friend, wrote eloquently about the politics of the Penan hunter-gatherers, which is a Far East politics that is quite like that of the West and the South, indeed of almost all peoples who depend on the forest for survival. Quote, in Sarawak, the wisdom of an entire people is waiting to be heard. Numbering some 7,600, of whom perhaps a thousand remain deep in the forest, following their ancient way of life, the Penan are one of the few truly nomadic rainforest societies of the earth. Related in spirit to the Mobutu pygmies of Zaire and the wandering Maku of the northwest Amazon, the Penan depended instead on wild populations of sago palm for their basic carbohydrate supply. The greatest transgression in Penan society is sihun, a term that translates roughly as a failure to share. Dependent on the forest for life and each other for survival, the Penan have in effect institutionalized individual generosity as a means of insulating the whole group as a whole from the inevitable uncertainties inherent in hunting and gathering ways of life. In Penan society, proper social behavior is learned by example rather than by rigorous discipline. And the importance of sharing is instilled in children from the earliest age. Young boys mastering the use of the blowpipe, for example, are encouraged to carefully divide the cooked meat from the smallest of prey, allotting equal portions to all the other children. In one instance, a young Penan youth who had gone hungry for several days killed a tele, the world's smallest squirrel, which he cooked and consumed alone. His failure to share provoked not anger, but laughter on the part of the adults. They simply bestowed on the boy the name tele, so that he would never forget his transgression. For all Dayak peoples of Borneo, the concept of private ownership of land did not exist. In the agricultural societies, customary law dictated that the community as a whole controlled the resource base. Individual proprietary rights were automatically granted to those who worked the land, provided they fulfilled the incumbent ritual and ecological obligations. This principle of land stewardship is enshrined in the traditional law, or adat, a concept that has moral, legal, and religious implications. 
the subversion of this philosophy, the imposition of a foreign notion of land tenure, and the wresting of control of the land from the indigenous peoples are three dominant themes that have molded Sarawak history since the time of the British. The Panan believed that the rainforest and its bounty were given to them by the creator, the god Balai Nge Butun. Their biological adaptation, together with their spiritual beliefs, demands that they exploit the forest in a sustainable manner. Central to their worldview is a sacred obligation to bequeath to the following generations a healthy forest fully capable of providing life to its human inhabitants. As the Penan elder explains, the land is sacred. It belongs to the countless numbers who are dead, the few who are living, and the multitudes of those yet to be born. How can the government say that all untitled land belongs to itself when there had been people using the land even before the government itself existed, end quote. As we mentioned in the last lecture, without being naive about human nature or harping on the noble savage stereotypes, drawdown solution number 39, indigenous people's land management, is crucial for our survival because only they have the cultural wisdom gleaned from millennia of trial and error to keep the land productive because they didn't descend from collapsed civilizations or if they did, they learned their lesson and applied it and now occupy the only remaining intact ecosystems on the planet. Only their wisdom can help us preserve the tropical forests, the last refuges of biodiversity on the planet, which comes in at number five of the hundred drawdown solutions, reducing CO2 by 61.23 gigatons with global costs and savings data too variable to be determined. Only with their help can we preserve and wisely use the coastal wetlands, which can store, quote, five times as much carbon as tropical forests over the long term, mostly in deep wetland soils, end quote. Soils that our culture is always dredging. Coastal wetlands comes in at number 52 among our solutions, reducing 3.19 tons of CO2, but protecting 53.34 gigatons of stored carbon with no real way to determine the cost. Our book says, quote, the soil of mangrove forests alone may hold the equivalent of more than two years of global emissions, 22 billion tons of carbon, much of which would escape if these ecosystems were lost, end quote. But these unsung carbon sinks have been relentlessly destroyed in the cowboy economy. Our book reminds us, quote, often in human history, wetland has meant wasteland, a place to dike, dredge, and drain for purposes ranging from farming to homesteading, these coastal ecosystems have suffered from mosquito spraying, pollution and sediment runoff, timber extraction, invasive species, and operations of the fossil fuel industry. They've been cleared to make way for shrimp farms, palm plantations, condo developments, and golf courses. Over the past few decades, more than one-third of the world's mangroves have been lost." End quote. Now here in Florida, most of it was due to conversion to cow pasture, which was patently stupid from an economic perspective because, as they point out, when you're standing on the wooden pier walkway over the swamp at, Gator at Gatorland in Orlando, munching on delicious gator steaks, alligators, being cold-blooded, are much more efficient at converting what they catch in the swamp into reptile beef than cows per unit of land. And that doesn't even include the fish and the frogs, the nutria and other mammals and reptiles and amphibians and cattails that we can harvest from the wetland. And yet, the Seminole Indians of Florida were able to survive and thrive quite well in those swamps when fighting back against the invaders for generations. As you will learn from the Tampa Bay History Center, which I highly encourage you to visit, they were among the last to give up until finally forced to march on the Trail of Tears because the coastal wetland swamp forests of Tampa Bay were so rich and comfortable. They were able to take what they needed and leave enough for those who came after consistently for thousands of years until politics forced them out. So much for the law of the jungle being red in tooth and claw or nasty brutish and short. So the real question for us as Americans in October of 2020 when this is being recorded isn't whether you favor a government that is Republican or Democrat or capitalist or socialist or communist or fascist or feudal or any of those modern manifestations of essentially similar agrarian societies based on exploitation and extraction. The real political issue is whether you want to be a taker or a lever. Which one are you?